Anglerfish by Coffin Stuffer Coyotes will sometimes lure domestic dogs into the woods by playing with them. A single coyote will approach the dog, ears forward, tail up, acting friendly as can be. It may even roll on its back and expose its belly in a show of submission to draw the dog into a bout of mock wrestling. Gradually, the games will push farther and farther away from the home, deep into the forest. That's when the rest of the pack appears, clusters. The dog's new friend becomes its executioner as the pack begins to attack. It's not uncommon for lonely children to bond with imaginary companions. They invent invisible friends to pass the hours away with. It is considered a typically harmless behavior, as long as the child understands the ultimate difference between fantasy and reality. I've often wondered about the correlation between invisible childhood friends and later mental disturbance. I wonder what the statistics of suicides and disappearances might look like when juxtaposed against the incident of imaginary friends and what age someone stopped seeing them. The first invisible friend I can remember was named Kevin. He was a little boy, just like me, if not a few years older. We used to play on the beaches of Lake Michigan, building sandcastles, collecting rocks and splashing around in the water. Kevin liked to swim a lot more than I did. He'd doggy paddle out far into the water, giggling and urging me to join him. I tried a few times, but whenever I swam more than ten feet from the shore, my mother would call me back. Kevin and I played together almost every week from early childhood until I was nine, and my family moved farther inland. I didn't even realize that Kevin wasn't a corporeal person until years later. I made some offhand comment to my mother about my old lakeside companion. She seemed confused, and said there was never another child when we went to the lake. I would laugh and talk to myself, but there was no Kevin. At least, not that she ever saw. Hyenas can mimic human laughter. There's a lot of African folklore about evil spirits that can imitate the voices of loved ones to draw you away from the village. These stories may have been fairy tales, but they served a very real purpose. The people who survived were the ones who didn't follow strange sounds in the dark. I met Polly a few weeks after my family had moved into a new house, in an area with dense forest and narrow roads. Rural Michigan might as well be the Canadian tundra. We are farther north than Toronto. Though the summers were pleasant enough, the winters got bitter cold. I don't know for a fact that I was the only one who could see Polly, because she only ever came around when I was alone. But once or twice, she seemed to disappear into thin air, which makes me think she wasn't made of flesh and blood. Polly was... weird. She made me nervous from the second she walked out of the woods. Maybe it was her bare, dirt-covered feet, or her wide, glassy eyes. Even at ten years old, I knew that other children weren't supposed to just appear like that. She shouldn't have been wandering around in the middle of nowhere without an adult. She always wore the same thing. A faded, floral dress with her straw-colored hair, in two messy braids. She never offered any explanation of where she came from, or where her family lived, beyond just pointing back into the woods. She said they didn't live far, they had a cabin out there. I didn't believe her. But I was bored. No other children lived within walking distance, so Polly and I would kick a soccer ball around, and climb trees, and play cowboys and pirates. She always wanted me to come back to her house. She said she had lots of fun games there, but I wasn't allowed to leave the yard. Polly was predictable, at least. She was always waiting for me after school, regardless of the weather. When it got too cold out, we played in the attic. I was alarmed by her lack of boots or winter clothing at first, but she always just seemed to shrug and said the temperature didn't bother her. She did try to get me to come outside with her sometimes. She'd say I didn't really need a coat either. She said that if you stayed in the snow long enough, he'd stop feeling it. At the time, I wasn't certain she was trying to harm me. She was confused, lonely, and desperate for a friend. 
but at the back of my mind, a nagging voice told me she didn't have my best interest at heart, so I never did follow her out into the elements without proper protection. Sirens are an ancient idea, creatures that take the shape of gorgeous women, or whatever their prey would find most enticing. Creatures that sing so beautifully they can bewitch any listener. Creatures that are such effective predators, their prey doesn't notice the trap until their ship has been dashed to bits on the rocky shore, and there's blood in the water. My family moved just a little outside Detroit when I was about 13. I'm sure you've heard a lot of stories about what the city's like, what a ghost town it is. I've even heard it compared to a post-apocalyptic wasteland. But you have to understand, it was a pretty gradual descent from the 60s until about 2000. In the early 90s, it wasn't in a terrible state that it is now. My parents and I moved into a relatively nice apartment complex. I went to a nearby middle school and it was fine. I didn't make friends very fast but I also wasn't scared for my life or anything. Robert introduced himself a few days after we finished unpacking our boxes. He was 15, a tall skinny black kid with a buzzed head and a thousand watt smile. He said he lived down in one of the basement units, though I never saw it. His father drank a lot and didn't like company. We would sometimes hang out at my place, but it was kind of cramped, and my mother was usually home. So Robert and I spent a lot of our time on the roof of the building, it was terribly exciting. I remember the way my heart used to skip a beat and flutter when we stole cigarettes from the corner store, or slipped a 40 into our baggy jeans. On cool autumn nights, when Robert and I would lie back on a blanket and look at the stars, my skin would get inexplicably warm. I'd feel strange and fuzzy all over, and it was more than just the watery beer. He talked to me a lot about how he wanted to be a pilot. He'd always dreamed of joining the Air Force. His dad said it was a stupid idea. They don't let faggots in the army. I'd never heard that word before. Faggot. It felt heavy and dirty, and also thrilling in the same way that everything about Robert was. When he cupped my face in his hands and pressed our lips together, it was like the hormonal floodgates burst open and I was suddenly hungry in ways I'd never experienced. I started to suspect Robert was not real when I saw him fall nine stories into a dumpster below and get up again without so much as a scratch on him. I decided to ignore all my better judgement, because I just wanted to keep kissing him. We only lived in that Detroit apartment for about eight months. By the end, I was well and truly in love, and when Robert whispered that there was a way we could stay together, I almost listened. But I didn't want to step off the roof. I was scared. I knew it would hurt. When I refused, Robert became despondent and disappeared. I didn't see him at all the last three days I spent in that building. Versions of skinwalkers and shapeshifters appear in most cultures. It's a terrifying idea. Being hurt by something that looks like a friend. Danger that seems harmless. Wolves in sheep's clothing. I can't help but wonder if something as old as humanity itself might be the thing these legends sprang from. Perhaps these stories are warnings of some primal memory. A creature that looks like a person, but absolutely isn't. After my parents split up, my mother and I went to Ohio. She had a sister there, just a short drive from Columbus. We all lived together in a trailer, along with my five-year-old cousin Becca. I was 16 by then, so I was often left to watch Becca after school and on weekends. I didn't mind too much. It wasn't like I had other friends. She'd fill in her coloring books whilst I did my homework, then we'd go outside. There was another little girl next door, Tess. She and Becca loved to run around together, racing up and down the dirt roads playing tag. Whenever they'd go too far off, too close to the parkway for comfort, I'd call them back. Becca usually listened, but Tess always seemed reluctant. I didn't think a whole lot of it. One day, when I was a little too engrossed in reading my comic book and not watching the girls closely, I heard a shriek. Tess, watch out! 
I looked up just in time to see a semi-trunk blasting past, not even slowing down as little Tess ran over. My jaw dropped. Panic shot through me. Sure, she wasn't my kid, and I hadn't been directly tasked with watching her, but this was still ostensibly my fault. I was on my feet, ready to run to Mr. Callan's house. I needed to borrow his phone to call the police. But Tess was still standing there, completely unharmed. She skipped off the road, giggling and whispering to Becca's ear. Becca still looked a bit shell-shocked, but smiled and hugged Tess close. My stomach twisted. It was terrible to see from the outside. One of those things trying to get my baby cousin. When I got close enough, I grabbed Becca's wrist and tugged her away. Tess eyed me close, cold and calculating, unlike any of them had ever looked at me before. Perhaps I'd gotten too old. The whimsical thinking of childhood had given way to suspicion and fear. Perhaps it could tell I'd caught on to its game. Perhaps it was angry I could even still see it. Most people my age couldn't. You leave Becca alone, I said firm as my crackling pubescent voice could muster. Or what? Tess smiled at me. I'd never noticed how sharp her canines were. How mean those overgrown dirty fingernails looked. I hadn't taken the time to get a really good look at her until that moment. I'll hurt you. Adam! Becca began to try and struggle out of my grasp, obviously embarrassed. Tess had started to back away, still smiling. She probably knew I couldn't do anything to her, but maybe I'd get to someone who could. A priest, a rabbi, or something. Becca, I kneeled down to be at her eye level. Look at me. Tess isn't real, okay? Real people can't get run over by a truck and live. Let me go! Becca wailed pushing at my hand ineffectually, trying to squirm free. Becca, please, it's important. You can't play by the road with Tess anymore. She wants to hurt you. Becca broke down into ugly tears, face bright red, windpipes constricting to conform unholy shrieks. I sighed, picked her up and carried her back to the trailer. She cried herself out and fell to sleep on the couch. When her mother got home that night, I told her Becca was playing too close to the road and wouldn't listen when I said it was dangerous. I hoped that was enough to warrant keeping her inside for a while. It wasn't more than a few weeks before Becca stopped talking about Tess. When I asked, she said that Tess had gone away. I took comfort in the fact that I hadn't seen her around either. Anglerfish are grotesque creatures. Ugly with long fangs and dull eyes. But in the depths of the ocean trenches, they can hide in the shadows. The only visible part of them is the glowing ball of light that sprouts from the antenna at the top of their head. They advertise salvation, the only source of illumination in the pits of despair. But any creature that takes the bait meets a sticky end. I still see them every now and then, little old ladies begging for help across a busy street, right when the light is about to change. Pretty strangers at bars who are far too aggressive in urging me to have another drink. Lonely hitchhikers that ask to travel to places the GPS will never find. But don't worry, they know the way. I'm not sure what they are. I can't be the only one who notices them. After all, most of us have had the ability at one point. We just grew out of it. Perhaps we shed it as a survival mechanism. Perhaps I'm one in a million. A kid who got stuck with a genetic allele that should have been bred out generations ago. Perhaps my existence is purposeful, and I'm the new evolution that comes to defending ourselves against the strange and bitter unknown. I can only say one thing for sure. Keep a close eye on your children when they start to tell you about their new invisible friend. Chances are, that friend is not friendly at all. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out the author's page in the description below. 
and follow me on Twitter if you want to keep up with what I'm doing. Until next time, stay safe.